Good evening and welcome <clears throat> to our closing dinner of the 2017 Future of Asia Conference. Thank you all for coming. I'm Terry McCarthy. I run the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. We're delighted to have you all here as our guests. Let me first recognize a few people in the room. Our chairman, Michael Siegel, is here. You're very welcome. Our Chairman Emeritus is here, Mr. John Hotchkiss. <laughs> Along with a number of our board members, Dan Eberhardt, Bill Tempko, Andrew Tabacoli, Greg Guillette, Priscilla Sands, Frank Kilpatrick, Kevin Hanley, and Ken Cressa. You're all very welcome. <laughs> a special welcome to Trish Swift, the wife of the Admiral, who's here sitting next to my great wife, Jennifer McCarthy, as they reminisce about going to school in Massachusetts. <laughs> a big thank you to our sponsors. And as you know, we can't do this without sponsorship. So thank you to all our sponsors, starting with East West Bank, and also GM Eagle, PlasPro, Air Canada, Merrill Lynch, and Citibank. We're very grateful for your support. Thank you so much. As you can imagine, putting on a conference of this scale requires a lot of planning. So a big shout out to my staff, particularly to Laura Bridge, Jessica McCarthy. <laughs> Alexandra Messman, Ellen Plant, and Sarah Tran. You guys were fantastic. I could not have done it without you. And on top of that, we've had tremendous help from interns and volunteers whom I'm sure a lot of you have interacted with during the conference. They were fantastic, and I thank you all for your help. And finally, let me, of course, thank all our speakers who came from all over Asia and the United States. Without you, we wouldn't have had a conference. The uh, standard of discussion and thought was really awe-inspiring. Uh, thank you so much all for coming, for contributing. We hope to see you all again next year. Thank you all. Now, let me just put the record straight a little bit and explain why we're ending with Admiral Swift. Because I don't want anyone to go away thinking that we spent a day and a half talking through the complexities of Asia, only to bring in the Navy and say, right, well, we can blow it all up and all go home and everyone will be happy. <laughs> that, I can assure you, is neither our intent nor is it Admiral Swift's intent, as I'm sure he will make clear when he talks. But let me just talk a little bit about that. Two very big things happened in the last 36 hours, both of which were connected to missile rocket technology. At uh, 3.10 a.m. Pacific time this morning, the Cassini spacecraft was deliberately crashed into Saturn by JPL after a 20-year mission. And if you've looked on the New York Times website, they have this extraordinary album of 100 photographs taken by that spacecraft which, frankly, can only inspire awe. Amazing that we can do this. It took a lot of collaboration, a lot of people. This is humanity at its best. Meanwhile, on CNN, we've seen endless looped footage of North Korean missiles taking off, which don't really inspire awe. They inspire some anxiety and some fear that this is how we can kill half a million people in a couple of minutes. And so the question is, it's the question of this conference, it's the question facing this entire Asia-Pacific region. What is the future of Asia? We all know that Asia is leaping ahead with artificial intelligence, mobile payment systems, robotics, advanced manufacturing, but Asia is also engaged in something of an arms race. People are somewhat nervous. from North Korea to other regional rivalries. There are tensions building up in Asia, and it would be foolish of us to ignore that. In fact, we don't ignore that, and this is where the United States comes in. Our military has kept the peace in Asia for the last 70 years, and has allowed the enormous economic growth, which we've all witnessed in Asia, the growth in incomes uh, in almost every Asian country except North Korea, um, have been quite extraordinary and have been facilitated by what our military have done to keep peace, to keep navigation lines open, 
uh, and to give, us, uh, to give access to many of these Asian countries to our markets. In fact, I would submit to you that nobody currently sitting in this room can honestly say they haven't benefited from the US peace and the trading conditions that we've established in the Asia-Pacific region in the last 70 years. Now, it doesn't behove us to think that we can use our military force to bully Asia, in fact, any other part of the world. That's not what I'm getting at. It's more, I think the United States can be very useful in keeping the peace. God forbid anyone should force our military to go to war. God help anyone who does. And so, we host Admiral Swift tonight in that earnest hope that US military capability will deter foolish actions in Asia and allow us all to experience the type of awe that we see when humanity performs at its peak rather than the horror of what we can destroy when we're divided by enmity and hostility. Admiral Scott Swift took command of the US Pacific Fleet in 2015, it's headquartered in Pearl Harbor, where he commands 200 ships and submarines, 130,000 sailors over an area of some 100 million square miles. I didn't even know the planet was that big, but apparently that's, that's his AO. He received his commission in uh, 1979, and so after 38 years, as you can imagine, he has amassed considerable experience, some of which we'll be privileged to hear about tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral Scott Swift. Well, thanks for that, uh, that kind and, and compelling introduction, Terry. The, uh, these are consequential times, and Michael, thanks for, uh, for all the great support um, that, that pulls this, uh, this conference together. And from everything I've heard, uh, to my uh, great regret, I was on, only able to just arrive uh, this afternoon. Um, so I guess the, uh, the good news is some of my most uh, compelling comments I, uh, I draft uh, at, the, at the table, and in fact listening to, uh, to Terry speak, um, I've done just that on the back of uh, my name, name card. That's the good news. The bad news is I have a binder here on the podium with all my comments that I wanted to share more broadly with the group. But let me, uh, let me start with, uh, with my comments to, uh, uh, to Terry's uh, uh, compelling introduction. And the first thing that ran through my mind is uh, tomorrow night uh, on, uh, on PBS, uh, Ken Burns will have a special on, uh, on Vietnam, uh, 18 hours uh, to my understanding. And in the discussions that I've had here uh, this evening prior to, to uh, coming here into the ballroom, um, it strikes, strikes me that what's most important is, uh, is the dialogue. And there was uh, four young high school students that were uh, here from the LA area that I spoke earlier and explained a little bit and I tried to put in a context uh, who I am as the, as the Pacific Fleet Commander. You can t talk about it from a military perspective um, the numbers of aircraft and, and ships. From a business perspective, um, as a Pacific Fleet uh, commander, um, I asked my staff to put it in a business context um, to, to help shape in terms of uh, what the Pacific Fleet commander is responsible for. And if you take a look at, took a, take a look at it from, a, from an asset perspective, um, I'm responsible for over $500 billion uh, worth of, of assets, material assets. Now, that, those are all assets that, for the Americans in the audience, that's your taxpayer dollars uh, hard at work. Uh, and and we, never, we never forget that. Um, I have a, uh, to run the fleet of the size that Terry uh, spoke about, uh, I have a uh, budget of uh, $12 billion. Um, that I uh, expend on a, on a yearly basis. And I'm grateful for the uh, commitment of American taxpayers once again uh, for uh, committing that money and that money flowing uh, through the uh, Congress and the President and down to, uh, down to the Pacific Fleet. Um, but as I had the discussions uh, here this morning already, it struck me that all those resources, all that, that might of the uh, Pacific Fleet 
The most important thing that I do, and this is the question that I asked of the uh, high school students here, what do you think the most important thing is that I do? And it's what every one of you are doing in this room tonight. And it's what every one of you, I think, does on a regular basis. And that's simply to build relationships. And the most important byproduct of relationships is trust. It doesn't matter whether it's a professional relationship or it's a personal relationship. Um, it's in the context of it's so easy to judge because it's so hard to understand. So I hope uh, over the days of this conference, Michael and, and Terry, um, that you've been able to build relationships and from those relationships trust and get beyond the judging to a deeper understanding of the challenges that we face. I'm not sure that anybody in this room understands what the future of Asia is. Um, but this discussion should be about what do we want the future of Asia to be. And there's many stakeholders in that. Part of which is, uh, is uh, the, uh, the military element. I will say that my comments tonight are, uh, are not a position, um, but a perspective. I'm not a policymaker. Um, that's the DC crowd that does that. I execute uh, policy with the resources that have been given to me by uh, American taxpayers, not the least of which are those 130,000 sailors that report for duty uh, every day to, uh, to the Pacific Fleet. So I'm very honored to, uh, to join you here uh, this evening um, and very uh, grateful for the opportunity. I, I'll be uh, completely honest and upfront. Uh, the first invitation went to uh, Admiral Harris, no surprise, because I'm sure those of you that were here uh, last year were enthralled and mesmerized by his presentation. Um, if that's the case, for those of you, you're going to be disappointed in the rest of, uh, in the, rest of the evening. Um, I'm also grateful for the Los Angeles World Affairs Council for teeing this, uh, this opportunity up. Um, it's unfortunate, I would suggest, that this is only a yearly event um, because it's critical that we bring like-minded individuals together and individuals with different perspective and different minds to face the challenges and dialogue that we face in what I describe, and I know what Admiral Harris does as well, the Indo-Asia Pacific region. And certainly, um, my thoughts center in that context, the maritime uh, security in the Pacific. So I'm mindful when I talk about uh, securing the Pacific that each of us may have a different definition of what that looks like. Uh, with uh, that in mind, I'd like to uh, share a few thoughts that might be helpful uh, to begin in providing a baseline of who we are in the U.S. Pacific Fleet and what we do in the dynamic region that we describe, Admiral Harris and myself, as the Indo-Asia Pacific. Um, the the uh, U.S. Pacific Fleet area encompasses, uh, arguably, different people say, is it 51, is it 52 percent of the world? I'll go with 51 percent of the world because there's a challenge just keeping after that uh, from a, a global perspective. Um, from Antarctica um, to the Arctic, uh, from the west coast of uh, California here uh, to a line drawn vertically south uh, from the border between uh, Pakistan and India. As I mentioned, it's, near, it's uh, just a little over half of the, the uh, Earth's surface. Uh, my headquarters is in uh, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. We have two uh, subordinate fleets. Uh, this morning I was in San Diego aboard um, the USS Theodore Roosevelt and presided over the change of command of the uh, third fleet, one of two fleets that uh, make up Pacific Fleet. The other fleet is uh, seven fleet forward deployed in Yokosuka, Japan, uh, normally headquartered aboard the U.S. Uh, seven fleet command ship, the USS Blue Ridge. Nearly 60% of U.S. Navy assets are assigned to the Pacific Fleet, which translates, as to, uh, Terry mentioned, um, close to 200 ships and submarines, uh, close to 1,200 aircraft, and more than 130,000 sailors and civilian sailors that stand ready to respond whenever and wherever crisis may occur in the Indo-Asia Pacific. The strategic framework within the Indo-Asia Pacific region is complex as you have been uh, discussing uh, up to uh, this point. The region we operate in is dominated and defined by the maritime domain. 
It is home to the three largest economies in the world, along with 10 of the 14 smallest, 15 of the 20 largest, busiest container ports, seven of the world's 10 largest militaries, five of the world's declared nuclear powers, and more than 50% of the world population. Seven of the top 15 U.S. trading partners border the region, and roughly, well, I'll say trillions of dollars, because I know that's an item of uh, debate, in trade passes through the South China Sea annually, and a number more agreed upon is 1.2 trillion of that is in U.S. trade alone. When you consider that 90% of world trade is moved by sea, which remains the most cost-effective way to move raw materials and goods around the globe, it is easy to understand that a safe and secure maritime environment is a precondition to the free flow of international trade and investment. In an increasingly interconnected global economy, many nations across the globe, including the U.S., have vested interest in the resources and trade that transit these waters and attendant interest in maintaining stability. Of note, the vast majority of internet traffic does not travel by satellite through space. It travels by cable through the seas. It's an example of the freedom of navigation most of us don't consider. This is the context within which I consider maritime security in the Indo-Asia Pacific. It is worth noting that security for security's sake is not very useful, in my opinion. Rather, the value of security is that it sets the conditions for stability, which in turn makes space that enables prosperity to grow. With that in mind, what I see as the most pressing maritime challenge facing the Indo-Asia Pacific today is the targeted erosion of the rules-based international system that has lifted millions out of poverty and benefited so many nations for the past 70 years. This system emerged out of the ashes of World War II, created by consensus and conciliation amongst nations that sought a more hopeful future in which all nations, large or small, are afforded, afforded the opportunity to reap the collective rewards of cooperation. Economies throughout the Indo-Asia Pacific continue to flourish today because of our mutual respect for and adherence to norms, standards, rules, and laws that have produced the longest era of peace and prosperity in modern history. But on land and at sea, that prosperity, rightfully belonging to all nations, regardless of size, strength, or wealth, is being challenged by some nations that seem to prefer a return to a world order in which might makes right, as the dominant mindset guiding international affairs. This is apparent in the South China Sea, where the use of mechanisms in place for resolving disputes or advancing national claims is being rejected in favor of an emerging alternative to the global order, one which leverages national power to coerce neighbors to the reluctant acceptance of unilateral actions. Disputed maritime claims in the South China Sea have existed for decades, but for the last eight years, China has claimed absolute sovereignty over a large swath of the South China Sea, encompassed by its self-proclaimed nine-dash line. That assertion has come at the expense of several other states with competing claims in those same waters. Admiral Harry Harris, commander of U.S. Pacific Fleet Command, offered this assessment regarding China's actions. Quote, China is using its military and economic power to erode the rules-based international order. They are building up combat power and positional advantage in an attempt to assert de facto sovereignty over disputed maritime features and spaces in the South China Sea. 
where they are fundamentally alter, altering the physical and political landscape by creating and militarizing man-made bases, end quote. That seems apparent, what seems apparent by these actions is that China intends to apply national law in international space in an effort to restrict freedom of navigation, a condition that has an impact well beyond the maritime domain. If states are willing to tr treat control of the global commons at sea as up for grabs, there is little reason for confidence that global commons within other domains, like space and cyber, are any more protected. At the heart of freedom of navigation discussions is the principle of unfettered access to the shared global spaces of all nations. China is challenging the principle, that principle across all elements of national power, characterized by the acronym DIME, diplomatic, information, military, and economic. In the diplomatic element, China has refused to seek multilateral solutions to conflict resolution in the South China Sea. Instead, it insists on bilateral negotiations which China's size, strength, and economic power serves to tilt the diplomatic landscape heavily in its favor. In the information element, China seeks to control information exchange and restrict potential for dissidents. There are numerous examples of this, like the national impingement of the use of virtual protected networks, or VPNs, a policy which abrades an individual's rights to share their information privately and freely, and more widely limits international exchange in a way that has far-reaching effects. In another example, a relatively new Chinese law requires all foreign companies to keep servers intended for serving Chinese users within Chinese borders. This requirement puts personal and professional information, business proprietary information, even banking information at risk of monitoring and theft with no guarantees that Chinese actors will be dissuaded from doing so. In the economic element, when South Korea announced it would deploy a theater high altitude air defense system to defend against North Korean provocation, the Chinese government has used unofficial sanctions against neighboring South Korea's auto, retail, and tourism industries to debilitating economic effect. In another expression of abusive economic power, large Chinese fishing fleets have repeatedly encroached on the, economic, on the exclusive economic zones of other sovereign nations in complete disregard for international law and ransacked resources that are intended for the coastal nation's economic benefit. The most recent example of this occurred just a few weeks ago when a 200-ship Chinese fishing fleet was intercepted in the Galapagos Marine Reserve within Ecuador's EEZ, which poached 330 tons of fish, including many protected species. This is not how those who have embraced the long-established rules-based order would describe a great power relationship. In the military element, China reinforces its exclusive territorial claims with coercive threats, largely ignoring a ruling because Chinese, uh, a ruling against Chinese exclusive maritime claims in a decision that was released last year by the Permanent Court of Arbitration at The Hague. China continues to patrol disputed waters while denying access to other nations. China enforces its exclusive claims using its greatly enlarged and modernized Coast Guard in conjunction with a well-resourced and prolific maritime militia to deny lawful access to the sea and freedom of navigation in ways that are calculated to fall below the threshold of provoking conflict. Various media reports of those interactions relay accounts of foreign mariners being harassed, intimidated, and in some cases having their vessels uh, confiscated and destroyed 
in encounters with Chinese law enforcement patrols. This raises more questions than answers regarding China's commitment to international law at sea and increases anxiety and uncertainty across the region. Smaller nations facing this growing preponderance of military and para paramilitary force just beyond their shores have little recourse but to acquiesce within such a coercive system. Not surprisingly, the climate of uncertainty created by these kinds of actions at sea has eclipsed as elicited a, a response. Nations are transferring ever larger shares of national wealth to develop more capable naval forces to defend their access to the global commons and assert their own national ambitions, thereby increasing the risk of increased regional tension, instability, and costly miscalculation. Each nation gains security in concert with other nations, and we all stand to lose when one nation chooses to aban abandon those principles that supported our collective growth. In contrast, freedom of navigation operations serve to reassert the inviolability of shared spaces and reaffirms America's commitment to upholding the rules-based international system. Accordingly, U.S. forces will continue to fly, sail, and operate throughout the globe in accordance with international law to ensure that access to the global commons, regardless of the domain, are afforded to all nations uh, and is not superseded by the ambitions of one. This is not to say that America and Chinese interests are locked in a spiral of escalation that will in inevitably lead to military clashes. On the contrary, our goal remains to convince China that its best future comes from peaceful cooperation, meaningful participation in the current rules-based international order, and honoring its international commitments. But the United States won't allow the shared domains to be closed down unilaterally. So we'll cooperate where we can, but remain ready to stand on principle where we must. Unlike China, North Korea has not reaped the collective benefits of participation in the rules-based order. Nighttime satellite imagery shows the stark contrast between a darkened North Korea and the bright lights of its prosperous neighbors. Underscoring the benefits of participation in the rules-based order and the consequence of self-imposed isolation. That isolation is chosen at the expense of the North Korean people, who suffer in misery as their government continues to prioritize its self-destructive pursuit of nuclear weapons over the well-being of their populace. Faced with the results of their rejection of a rules-based system, the Kim regime irrationally lashes out at the global community with inflammatory threats of nuclear attack and misguided choices that defy logic and explanation. Within the last three weeks, North Korea has conducted several missile launches in violation of United Nations Security Council's resolutions, including two mid-range ballistic missile launches across the Japanese island chain. Then, earlier this month, they, created, they carried out their latest and largest nuclear test. These provocations only serve to increase the international resolve to deter DPRK's prohibitive activities. The, con the, the concert of nations continues to roundly condemn North Korea actions. Both the European Union and ASEAN have publicly denounced North Korea's actions as threats to international peace, stability, and security, as have many other regional and global voices. Even those nations with diplomatic and commercial ties to North Korea, like Russia, Indonesia, and the United Arab Emirates, have called Pyongyang to end its provocations. Last month's unanimous United Nations Security Council resolution imposing new sanctions on the Kim regime underscores the extent which North Korea has chosen to isolate itself from the international community. 
That isolation need not continue, and I leave it to the political leadership to determine the course of action that will bring Pyongyang to its senses. Should democracy fail, the U.S. Pacific Fleet stands ready, if called, to provide overwhelming combat power in defense of our nation and our allies. 67 years ago, Pacific Fleet ships dominated the waters surrounding the Korean Peninsula. Today's Pacific Fleet continues that heritage of victory. In the wake of recent tragedies aboard USS Fitzgerald and the USS John S. McCain, some adventurous states might feel there is opportunity to take advantage of a perceived moment of weakness. Please allow me to dispel that knowledge altogether. Allies, partners, and friends can be reassured knowing that America's Pacific fleet remains the strongest fleet in the world, with a host of highly capable forces available like the carrier strike groups, upgunned expeditionary strike groups, Aegis ships, the world's most advanced submarine force, and aircraft like the F-35, the P-8, and the MH-60 Romeo. Our sailors are exceptionally trained, and our platforms have longer reach and are more interconnected and possess more lethality than ever fielded before in the history of the world. Along with like-minded allies and partners and friends, the U.S. Pacific Fleet will continue to wield its power responsibly to provide security for the sake of stability, to enable the ever-rising tide of prosperity that continues to sweep across the Indo-Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much. And now, having shared what is on my mind, I'm interested to find out what's on yours. So if you have questions, please put up your hands. We have microphones here and here. Let's start with uh, Ran Song Tzu from Beijing. Uh, OK, let me hold it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Admiral. Thank you for you uh, kindly give American perspective. However, you talked a lot about uh, maritime rule and norms. My name is Ram from China. But if American have had ratified UNCLOS, it will be far convincing for you to talk about maritime rules and norms. So my question is, when do you think American will ratify the UNCLOS? Thank you. Um, I, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's important to note that um, as far back as my memory goes, uh, every uh, chief of naval operations that's uh, testified in front of uh, Congress in their confirmation hearing um, has endorsed and encouraged the, uh, the ratification of UNCLOS. And in fact, as a matter of point, uh, the UNCLOS law was, uh, was signed, I believe, by President Reagan. It just hasn't been ratified by uh, Congress yet. Uh, further, uh, uh, certainly as far back as, as my memory goes, um, all of our uh, uh, chairman of our Joint Chiefs of Staff has also advocated for the ratification of uh, UNCLOS. Um, so as a, as a naval officer, I also encourage uh, the ratification of UNCLOS by the United States Congress. Um, the last point I'll make is that uh, the United States Navy, for as long as I've been in the Navy, and another by January of, uh, of this year, I will have served in the Navy for, uh, for 40 years. And in that 40 years, the Naval Service, the United States, naval, uh, the United States Navy, has uh, sailed in complete compliance uh, with UNCLOS. And uh, when executing freedom of navigation operations around the world, it's always done in uh, uh, the complete allegiance uh, to UNCLOS as uh, signed by uh, the United Nations. Uh, Admiral, thank you. Uh for sharing your, uh, your views. I think they actually fit very well with, or added a point of view that were today's discussions. And you gave a very stark view of the situation in Asia from a geopolitical perspective. You talked about trust. And I think one of the things that a lot of people say in Asia is that our president has fundamentally undermined trust with our allies in Australia, 
obviously big questions in South Korea, Taiwan. Um, and obviously we have the other, your boss, other parts of the administration having to either clarify or refute what the president says. So when you meet with your counterparts, either among our allies or our opponents, and they lean into you and say, who should we trust? What should we believe? Can you give us a sense of what you're trying to say? The, um, it's uh, uh, an understandable question. It's not an uncommon question. I, I just came back from a trip. Uh, well, I'm always traveling. It's hard to say what trip I just came back from. But um, just recently in, uh, in China, it was recently in Korea, recently in Japan, uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, Australia before that, uh, Indonesia, uh, or Malaysia. I was on my way to Indo Indonesia when I ended up uh, going to, uh, to Singapore. Um, your, your question is not uh, unique. It's on the mind, I know, of many of Americans, uh, certainly in my family and others as well. Um, and it's certainly on the minds of all of those that I interact with on a regular basis uh, out in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Um, but my response to them is it starts with me. You know, I can't speak for others. Uh, I have to speak for, for myself. So I've been uh, very blessed uh, with having been uh, assigned uh, back to the Pacific. My career started, first 15 years of, of my career was, was uh, steaming as a, as a Pacific fleet sailor. Um, spent uh, the next 10 years or so, as most of us have in the Middle East, and then I came back to, uh, to the Pacific back in 2000, 2006, 2007. Um, so I've got a, uh, a deep relationship uh, with many um, senior leaders uh, in, uh, in the, the Indo-Asia Pacific that started off at a more junior level when I was uh, more junior. And so it comes back to uh, a comment um, that I made with several in the room. Um, when you look at the, the, uh, the power of the Pacific Fleet that's made up however you measure power, whether it's financial power or if it's military power, and I ask people, what do you think the most important thing that I do is? And no one has given me the direct answer. Now, there's four high school students in here that can give the answer now, which is it's about building relationships. But that's just the first part of it. Um, the most important element of building relationships is trust. And it's also the most perishable. It's to the point of your question. So we have to stay engaged forward. We have to stay engaged in, in the theater. It's why this gathering is so important. This gathering to me speaks to the power of diversity because we all come from different places, you know, where we stand, what we do, but we end up in a common destination. The focus is in Asia, regardless of, of what your views are. Um, and that comes back to that point of, uh, of building relationships. We've got to get beyond the point of judging. We've got to get to the point of understanding. And the only way we're gonna to get to that point of understanding is having that dialogue. Because it is so easy to judge. It, it's so easy to have someone say something and saying, I know exactly what they're saying. I knew that's what their comments were gonna be. What's important is this dialogue, not the comments that are made from a podium or not the comments that are made at a press availability. It's, it's that broad dialogue. It's the fact that this uh, symposium has extended over such a long period through so many panels and been such a, a rich dialogue. To, to your comment on the president, I, I wear a uniform and I've sworn an oath, oath to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And our national laws are set that the, the commander in chief, our president, is, is my commander in chief. So I, I respond to, to his orders. I think we need to be clear on that. Uh, there were many people in the previous administration that would question uh, the allegiance of the military uh, to President Obama. So let, let me make it clear to the discussion that I have with my counterparts in the, in the military, our allegiance is to the Constitution of the United States and that Constitution demands our allegiance to our Commander in Chief. So our Commander in Chief was elected by the American public and that's, it's those orders that we're gonna respond to in the military. Having said that, I'm known, uh, I've got to hesitate every time I say his name because I'll, instead of calling him Secretary Mattis, I'll call him General Mattis. So I've known Secretary Mattis for a long time. And I could not be happier with him as a secretary. He, he solicits dialogue, 
He wants a deeper understanding of what the issues are. Hard to believe uh, because he has such a broad understanding of all the issues across the world. I'm, I'm blessed that I'm only responsible for understanding 51% of the world. He's got to understand 100% of the world. Um, but I, I guess I'll close on this point is that I'm a firm believer in democracy. And my father used to always uh, tell me about democracy and he, he was a, a big theory kind of guy. Um, but he, he always came back to the same point that he said, with democracies, they tend to self-correct. So whatever your view was, if your view is with this administration or the previous administration or a future uh, administration, I've got great faith in our system. I've got great faith in democracy, and I believe my father's view that democracies tend to uh, self-correct. Uh, self so if you're not happy with the current state of events in the United States, wait a little bit. It's, <laughs> It's going to change. And oh, by the way, everyone in this room has a vote. Sheila, to your left. Admiral Smith, Sheila Smith from the Council on Foreign Relations. I want to thank you for your leadership and for the service of the 130,000 men and women in uniform. I wanted to ask you about our alliances in Asia. Uh, they're under increasing pressure, as you articulated, from the rise of Chinese military influence in the region, but also, as we saw this morning, from the missile threat and ultimately the nuclear threat from North Korea. Share with us your sentiment or your, your, your thinking about how do we make sure our allies are safe and what are we doing to make sure that they feel confident in our leadership? Yeah, well, thanks for that, uh, uh, Sheila, and thanks for all that you continue to do to uh, strengthen the relationships uh, that we have. Uh, across the whole Pacific Fleet uh, AOR, and, uh, and thanks for, for staying at it. Um, I'm, I'm struck by, uh, I, I attended a change of command um, uh, recently, and, and the incoming commander uh, referred to an interview that he had uh, seen uh, recently with, uh, with Venus Williams. And uh, she had, had just lost. She was uh, out of the, uh, the U.S. Open. And, and the reporter asked the question, now this is second, third, fourth, fifth hand, so I've got great liberty to say whatever I want, and no one can uh, attribute it to me. Um, but this is what I think that she said uh, through very well-informed four or five other individuals. Uh, but her, the, the question of the reporter was in the context of how do you feel about uh, having lost? And, uh, and her response, I thought, was, was compelling. And the word that she used, what is, as having lost, what does that mean to you as a professional, as a professional tennis player? And in my mind, the thought, the counter thought that came to that uh, as, a, as an amateur. And her response was pressure. And she said, when I take the, the practice court, take to the practice court, I don't feel very much pressure. I've done it, you know, hundreds of thousands of times. But I know that opponent or that practice partner on the other side of the net uh, feels a great amount of pressure because of you know, who I am and my, my tennis ability. And then she took it to the next step in the US Open in the initial matches when she takes the court. She doesn't feel a lot of pressure because she knows what the ranking is. But she knows there's an awful lot of pressure on the other side of the net. And what she said is, she said, I don't feel bad about losing because I know I did not succumb to the pressure, that I played the best match that I possibly could and I was outmatched. That opponent on the other side of the net beat me. I didn't lose because I lost my concentration. I didn't lose because I was double faulting through all the matches. I didn't lose because you know, I couldn't keep the ball in play. That's the difference of, of uh, uh, I think, between a, a professional and an amateur. And that's what I see in our allies, partners, and friends in the Pacific. It's what I see in the PLAN. I know the South Sea Fleet Commander. I know the North Sea Fleet Commander. I know the East Sea Fleet Commander. I know the, the commander of the PLAN, Admiral Shin. And I will tell you, they are as professional a force um, that steams the world's oceans as, as the United States Navy. Um, and that's the thoughts that went through my mind uh, as, uh, as I was sitting at that change of command. The challenge that we have is the uncertainty that we face across the globe. I think to attribute that uncertainty to any one nation is a mistake. And I, was, I think I was talking to Michael early this evening, or it might have been Terry, 
So when I get this question about stability, I start in, in uh, England, and you look at Brexit and all the uncertainty that, that is racking the, the uh, English people and the English government. Look at what's going on in uh, France now with the elections that what they went on and the uncertainty before uh, Macron was, uh, was elected, what the outcome uh, might be. And look where he is now from uh, the height uh, that he was at immediately after the election and where he is. Look at where Merkel is in Germany. I mean, I could take another two hours and walk you around the globe, uh, you know, through where are we with Turkey now? Where are we with Syria? Where are we with Iraq? Where are we with Iran? Where are we with Afghanistan? All the way through China, Australia, uh, Papua New Guinea, and then you finally end up back in the, uh, in the United States. So what troubles me, and it gets to the, to the question that was brought before, that oftentimes the dialogue is turning to a military-to-military -military dialogue, and that is what we need is a dialogue that continues to stay focused on diplomacy. Now, I'm amazed I haven't gotten a question on North Korea yet. But in, in anticipating a question on North Korea, make note about, no, no doubt about it, um, certainly from a U.S. perspective, the pursuit is, is a path of diplomacy. We've got to find a diplomatic solution, a, a solution through dialogue to understand what the heck is going on in Kim Jong-un's mind and how do we get him off this path that the solution to his future, whatever he wants his future to be, is a nuclear solution. Um, so I, when I visit these countries, I'm seeing people that I should not be talking to. They are well above my position as a Pacific Fleet commander. It's normally dialogues that commanders like Admiral Harris have. It, it's with ministers of defense. It, it's with foreign ministers. It's with prime ministers. More and more I'm finding myself in those dialogues. And I think that is reflective of the uncertainty, not just of the uncertainty within the United States, but the uncertainty that's sweeping across the, uh, across the globe. Who would imagine, you know, with a nuclear test, you know, what's most compelling about the nuclear test in North Korea, that it was done when Xi Jinping was sitting down with President Putin, and we've got the party Congress coming in October. I mean, it is so destabilizing, so counterproductive to getting to a stable place, just in the Indo-Asia Pacific, much less from a global perspective. That's why collectively all these nations are coming together to, to, to uh, realize that we have to collectively find a solution to the challenge that's presented by these actions of Kim Jong-un in, in North Korea. So that's a long way from a question of, of who I talk to when I go to Japan or when I go to Korea or to the other countries. But I think uh, the big takeaway is the audiences that people that I I gain with people asking uh, me to come uh, speak to them. It's not uh, Ambassador Haggerty is doing a fantastic job in Japan. There's no uh, lack of uh, engagement across the uh, Japanese government there. Um, but I think it's that sense of uncertainty of what's going on in the world right now. Your question over here. And then Jim, and then Wushin Marcus Bowles, Min of J.M. Tom. Eagle. Uh, as a former civilian contractor, I'd like to say thank you for your service and everything you and your men over there do. Um, they don't do anything. I, I do everything. <laughs> That's how it normally was. Um, speaking about North Korea, um, in normal circumstances, specifically in battle space, and I apologize for using a lot of acronyms here, implementing A2AD to control potential enemy RPAs, C4 or C5 ISR, um, and the technology used for those warfare, you know, you usually use A2AD anti-axis aerodynamic. But when you're dealing with North Korea that has such a lack of technology, how do you control the battle space at that point, and how do you prevent collateral damage? If you're, you know, without the technology to, you know, maybe use a cyber attack or to do something specifically in a certain area, you're missing. You're, you're, you're kind of guessing where your, your hot spots are. Yeah, how do, how do we prevent, with, with our fires, uh, the blue fires, how do we prevent collateral damage in North Korea? I'd have to stop and think, maybe I should be more worried than I am. Um, <laughs> th th maybe you know something that I don't. It's, a, it's the important area that we're talking about, the dialogue. What I'm most interested in the dialogue is I learn in the dialogue from the questions being asked and your responses. So. Um, those people at that table over there are getting real busy right now because they know what the questions are that I'm going to start asking them. Are we missing something? But this is the power of, of, uh, of technology, and I think it's the power of, of, uh, 
the U.S. military and how we're supported by the U.S. military industrial uh, complex. So we have passive systems that are, that are important to us that, that require emissions and, and cooperative targets. We exploit all kinds of things that, that uh, are out there in the world that, that you know, people obviously don't know that, that we can exploit them and what value it brings us to a, to a, from a military perspective. Um, but we have an awful lot of active systems as well. So I, I, am, I have complete confidence in our U.S. ability um, to cover down on uh, North Korea as a threat. If, if I get ordered to do something with respect to North Korea, and I know I'm speaking for Admiral Harris as a joint force commander, but just as a naval commander, um, we have all the capability, all the technology necessary uh, to cover down on any threat that might emanate from North Korea. And we can do it in a way um, that minimizes the threat to the uh, North Korean people um, because we have active capability as well. You, you mentioned uh, anti-access area and denial as well. I, I happen, I, I, you know, in a perfect world, uh, Admiral Richardson spoke once that I know of about anti-access area denial and he felt that, that uh, uh, that was not a very productive term. I'd like to think he was channeling to me. I hate that term uh, because we use it as a barrier. We act as if uh, the, the countries can throw out these anti-access area denial systems that prevent U.S. forces from operating in any specific phase. It's space. It's nonsense. A2AD, it, it goes back to when we transitioned from sails uh, driving our ships to steam driving our ships. And it was like, oh my God, uh, it's a complete game changer. We had an overlap of about 100 years where we had sailing ships and steam ships. And sailing ships were much more effective for the first 50 years of steam, just because they were trying to develop the technology. And I won't go, my, my, I, can, I can feel the, the uh, laser stares from, uh, from my staff over there uh, telling me to get off this subject, something that I'm, I'm passionately uh, in, interested in, but you're probably only mildly interested in. Um, but I talk about uh, in the context of uh, uh, the advent of nuclear weapons and the decision to use nuclear weapons in uh, Japan at the end of World War II, and people said that's the end of conventional war. You know, we'll never have conventional war again. How many conventional wars have we had since then? So it's one of, uh, I mean, uh, a ton. Uh, that's one of the most compelling thing about North Korea because is North Korea going to be t deterred from a nuclear perspective and the conventional deterrence that we've known um, from a nuclear perspective? But I think we tend to oversell some con uh, concepts such as A2AD. But I'll, I'll get off the stage on that point and let Terry uh, take it. Jim? Yeah, uh, Jim McGregor. Um, you, you gave a very clear explanation of the U.S. view of the South China Sea with China. You were recently in China. When you're speaking um, to your counterparts in China, what are they coming back to you with? I, I know you probably can't say too much, but what is your dialogue with, the, with the, both the Chinese political leaders or military leaders that you, you meet with? Because the U.S. has a very clear view, yeah. and China's got a completely opposite view. How do you, how, what's the dialogue? So let me, let me try this for my Chinese friends in the audience. It's sovereign Chinese territory. I mean, you go back from a historical perspective, the nine dash lines, these were uh, lines drawn on a chart, you know, long ago. This is Chinese national territory. Um, it, I mean, it's as simple as, it's, it's the issues with, uh, with India and Nepal. It, it's the same, it's the historic, if, if you look at the, uh, the current um, declaration of Indonesia, of uh, the, uh, I'll get it wrong, not the Naha Sea, but they, they have a new naming convention for the waters around Naha Island. And China has come out clearly and saying, no, that is, that is Chinese territory. Um, so we, we understand what our positions are, and we understand that our positions are different. It's the context that we need to talk about those, those differences. But let me tell you about the conversations that I have with my counterparts in, in the PLAN. Um, now, I have to commend my, my Chinese colleagues at uh, the depth of understanding and the detail um, that they have as to what um, their national policy positions were. I, I could only wish that U.S. military leaders had the same understanding of what the U.S. policy was. 
Um, if we could just get a clear policy, it would be easy to uh, communicate what that, that policy was. Um, and so in my first exchanges, you get the 20-minute dialogue or the, you, get a, you get a half hour office call and, uh, and you get uh, uh, 25 minutes of this is, this is what the Chinese uh, position is. And that's, that's not productive. That's not where we want to have the discussion. So once I gain some experience, I would say, look, I, I can give this, this lecture better than you can. I'll give you five minutes of it just to convince you. Let's get to the discussions that are consequential. Look, Xi Jinping and President Trump do not want a tactical miscalculation in the South China Sea that triggers a strategic event that forces the two of them to deal with it. That's clear. There's unanimity there in that view. And there's got to be unanimity in the, in the perspective between the Pacific Fleet Commander, the South Sea Fleet Commander, the East Sea Fleet Commander, and the North Sea Fleet Commander, and the commander of the PLAN. It gets back to relationships. It gets back to dialogue. So Yamamoto was the, uh, was the architect of the uh, uh, Japanese uh, strategy for defeating the US. He was very close personal friends with Admiral Nimitz. They had spent significant time together from 2010 through 2020 uh, 20 through 2030. They knew each other. And that's when Yamamoto made that famous statement that after the attack on Pearl Harbor, his fear was that he had awakened, a, that, that uh, Japan had awakened a sleeping giant it's because he knew Nimitz and he knew the power of the United States. That's why these mill-to-mill -mill relationships are so important. The mill-to-mill -mill relationships between the PLAN and the Pacific Fleet has never been stronger. And it's very important that we continue those relationships. Otherwise, we have a higher potential that we're going to have a tactical trigger that results in strategic implications that is not going to allow us to have con uh, conferences like this that talk about hypotheticals, and we're going to be talking about realities. That's why this relationship is so important. And that's why this symposium is so important that encompasses so many people with differing views. Everyone needs to be given a microphone and have an opportunity to share their voice. Admiral, we have time for one more question. Now your staff is keen to get you out of here. Uh, Wishing Bowie have the last question. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you, uh, Admiral Wushimbo from China. We just chatted over the uh, port side. Um, Regarding the uh, freedom of navigation operation, um, I think the, uh, many people don't know that this is actually a unilateral uh, US action, uh, not uh, something multilateral approved by the United Nations. The US launched uh, freedom of navigation, uh, navigation operation before the UNCLOS came into effect because it was concerned the UNCLOS might impose some limit on the uh, 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 um, action of the U.S. in a global contest. So at that time, you know, South China Sea was not the focus of the issue. And also, in international law, you cannot find any stipulation allowing the U.S. to conduct uh, this freedom of navigation. And even more than that, uh, actually, um, U.S. has been conducting this through uh, military means, through military aircraft and uh, Navy ships. So in fact, this is a freedom of a military action operation. And for that purpose, I think the US has been uh, pursuing uh, military intelligence we're, we're and the geopolitical the purpose. The so my question is, how, when you, you, know, you criticize China for not by, uh, abiding by the international laws and the rules, how can you convince China that your freedom of navigation operation global wide does conform to the international law and the rules? So that's my question. Thank you. So it's a uh, it's a great question, and it's a question that uh, that requires a uh, a continued dialogue uh, because the the uh, the source of the question comes from a position of interpretation, and it's an interpretation of uh, of UNCLOS. Uh, so. Uh, UNCLOS states that uh, e economic uh, uh, zones, EEZs, are uh, limiting from a commercial perspective. It limits commercial activities within that zone. It does not limit military activities. And I assume that China agrees because just recently tri China had an intelligence collection ship that was operating in the Australian EEZ during Talisman Sabre. 
And, and I endorse that activity. And I think the U.S. government endorses that activity. I haven't heard a, a criticism of that. Chinese intelligence ships and, in fact, Chinese military ships operate on a regular basis in the U.S. EEZ, especially in the vicinity of Guam. And I'm an advocate for those operations because I see those operations as being in complete compliance with UNCLOS. And, in fact, I've advocated for flying my aircraft out to the ships, the, the Chinese ships that are operating in the U.S. EEZ, and to ask the question, please confirm that you are conducting military operations and not commercial operations. Because if you're conducting commercial operations, you're in violation of UNCLOS, and it would be a requirement of U.S. law to send a Coast Guard ship out to exercise uh, the legal um, uh, uh, manifestation of international law, uh, UN law. Um, so this now becomes a discussion uh, back and forth of, uh, of the definition of UNCLOS. And, and I think uh, one of your colleagues mentioned the challenge that we have because Congress hasn't unified UNCLOS. And because challenge, uh, China has not uh, ratified UNCLOS, I can only talk to you as a practitioner not someone who has uh, under, uh, underscored that has uh, uh, ratified uh, the law. Uh, so that's one point. The other point is, is that every, and we do use military ships to challenge uh, these claims because the military ships uh, have uh, rights within UNCLOS, within an EEZ that commercial ships do not. Commercial ships can only transit. So if a military ship was to conduct a, a, a man overboard drill or some, some uh, circuitous navigation that was not the most expeditious path, uh, we are not uh, violating UNCLOS, just like a PLA and ship wouldn't be uh, violating UNCLOS because they're a military vessel. A commercial vessel does not have that latitude under, under the, uh, uh, the UN uh, law of the seas. The last point I'll make on that is that uh, the approach that we take is no different than the hundreds of freedom of navigation operations that we conduct around the world. I think there's too much focus of freedom of navigations in the South China Sea. I think we should just uh, talk broadly about freedom of navigations around the world where the U.S. Navy is directed by U.S. policy to challenge excessive claims by any country in the context of UNCLOS everywhere in the world. We should not separate South China Sea as being any different. And in fact, the vast majority of freedom of navigation uh, operations that we conduct is not against any one country. It's against countries that have multiple claims that the United States feel are in violation of compliance uh, with UNCLOS. But what's most important is we continue the dialogue. There's a dialogue that's important to have in an audience like this that's from a, a broader policy, academic kind of perspective. And there's another dialogue that needs to happen in more structured military channels with lawyers, uh, uh, law of the sea lawyers, maritime lawyers um, that have a deep understanding of the intricacies of uh, maritime law of the seas. But it's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it, and I'm glad your colleague asked the question about UNCLOS as well. These, this is the compelling discussion that we need to have. Much better to have this discussion here in a forum like this than a discussion in confrontation. Look, I'll say this about my relationship with China. As the Pacific Fleet Commander, I have much more in common with China than I do in competition. And it's not bad to have a competition. That's what Venus Williams thinks. That's what I think. That's what Admiral Shen thinks. Competition is not a bad thing. We, under, we need to understand the rules that govern that competition. Admiral, Admiral thank you so much. My takeaway is we need to talk more. That's the point of our conference. That's why we welcome having you here tonight. I thank all our participants from all over Asia and the United States for your participation. And we'll see you here back again 2018. Admiral, thank you so much.